Let the church say amen. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, once again to the book of Esther. This is the fourth sermon in a five-sermon series as we uh, take an expositional look through the book of Esther with a focus on Mordecai. So uh, it's life lessons, or lessons from the life of Mordecai and Esther. And while you're turning to the uh, seventh chapter, we'll do the closing of the seventh and beginning of the eighth and through the eighth chapter together today. Uh, let, me just, let me just walk you through our life lessons together here, and then we'll stand and read the key verses here. As we spend our time in the first, <coughs> the first message uh, from the series, we focused our attention on how God prepared was in the process of preparing Mordecai and Esther. And our first three life lessons from, from chapter 2 of Esther uh, were that God's preparation, they're on the screen for you in the King James, God's preparation for kingdom service begins with a heart enlarged and a vision expanded by a life surrendered to him. Secondly, we spent time as we, as we looked at how God was moving them through this, this journey, uh, that God's preparation for kingdom service includes honesty and integrity developed by walking with him as Mordecai shared about the plot that was against King Ahasuerus. And finally, God's preparation for kingdom service is fortified as he empowers us to stand firm in faith in him during life's trials. We moved on to the next, uh, to the next uh, uh, life lesson series as we focus in chapter 4 on how God positions uh, the believer uh, through his plan and his purpose. And our focus there in chapter 4 was that God positions and strengthens believers to remain faithful and firm in the presence of sin and suffering as, as Mordecai is now beginning to experience his Haman moment. God positions and emboldens believers to respond faithfully and obediently to his call and purpose for their lives. And finally, in that chapter, God positions and favors believers as we prayerfully and humbly seek his presence, protection, and provision in all areas and circumstances of our lives. And then last week, we spent some time uh, looking uh, into chapter 6, uh, looking at these focal, these focal life lessons. Uh, God is faithful to bless and protect the obedient follower in, his, in, in God's unbelievable ways and in his unexpected uh, times is really what we're focusing on. And God is faithful to turn the enemy's evil plan into God's grace-filled blessing for the steadfast believer. And finally, we focus on how God is faithful to provide help and hope for the humble follower while presenting lessons and direction uh, to the rebellious fighter that all may learn to lean on him. Today, we're, we're spending our time uh, looking at chapter 7 and chapter number 8. eight. Um, and if you found that in your Bibles, will you say amen? And if you don't mind standing with me, let us read our key verses together from the King James translation, which will be verses 15 and 16. As we read together, it says, And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, and with a great crown of gold, and with a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor as you take your seats. As you remember, as we spent our time last week, we, we've moved to the episode here in those earlier chapters where uh, Haman has come to the king. The king, the Lord has, God has wakened the king, won't let him sleep in the middle of the night and, and made him restless because there's some unfinished business that he has. And, and he calls, he calls his, uh, uh, his chamberlains to the, to the chamber and says, uh, what, what's, what's in uh, the Chronicles? And as he looks through the Chronicles, he finds out that Mordecai was indeed the, the man who gave the message that, that saved him from being uh, ambushed by two of his followers. And he says, what have I done for Mordecai? And the Chronicles record nothing has been done. And so the king feels this dynamic obligation to fulfill what needed to be made right, make right what needed to be made right on behalf of Mordecai. And as Esther has now stepping up and beginning to uh, fulfill the purpose and plan that God has directed her, she's calling Esther King that he might have, he might come to, uh, 
to dinner. He's already had the king and Haman over. And Haman is thinking in his mind, there's nobody else but me who's come along with the king to this banquet by Esther. Surely I am in favor with the king. And if there is to be, and, and as the king is saying to his chamberlain, uh, wait, early in the morning, I need somebody. I, who's, in the, who's in the palace? I need somebody here right now because I need to fulfill, complete this, this commitment that I have to make right that which has been made wrong. I haven't fulfilled the blessing on the person that has blessed me. He looks around, Haman's there. Calls Haman to the king early in the morning. Haman's thinking to himself, uh, uh, the king is going to bless me. And as the king asked him, what should I do for the person who has provided such a blessing for my life? Haman is thinking to himself, it can't be anybody but me. I'm, I'm his right hand. And so Haman, Haman, thinking in very selfish terms, lays out this, this litany of blessing that he should do for the man who has blessed the king. And then King Ahasuerus turns to Haman and says, now I need for you to go do that for Mordecai, the Jew. And Haman has to parade Mordecai down through the streets of Shushan, and, and royal apparel with the, king's, with, the, with the crown on his head so that everybody sees that, that Mordecai is being blessed and honored by the king. And now Haman recognizes that he's in trouble. And he goes back home, talks to his wife, and she tells him, now if you, have, if you indeed uh, are rising up against this, this Mordecai, the Jew, and the Jewish people because he's put this petition out to, on a certain day they will wipe out the Jewish population, then you are about to fall. You are about to fall. As we, look in, as we look in chapter 7, you begin to see that Queen Esther has now uh, called, has now brought uh, the king and Haman, uh, the king into this dinner. And it, we pick up with verse number 5 through 10. I'll read it from the Amplified, and we'll put the King, we'll put the king James translation on the screen. Three life lessons I want to share with you today. It says, Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, After... It, let me give you the background of the first four verses. The queen comes to the king and says, would you, would you fulfill a petition for me? He said, if, if I found favor in your sight, will you fulfill a petition to me? Because both me and my people are in danger of being uh, extinguished. Your petition has basically indicated you will wipe us out on a, on a certain day. And the king is asking the question, who is he? And where is he who dares to presume in his heart to do that? And Esther says, an adversary and an enemy, even this wicked Haman. Uh, then Haman was afraid before the king and queen. And as the king, and the king arose from the feast in his wrath and went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Queen Esther, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. And when the king returned out of the palace garden into the places of the drinking of wine, Haman was falling upon the couch where Esther was. The brother was begging for his life. And then said, then said uh, the king, will he even forcibly assault the queen in my presence, <laughs> in my palace? And as the king spoke these words, the servants covered Haman's head. And then said, uh, Harbano, Harbano, one of the attendants serving the king, behold, the gallows 50 cubits high which Haman himself has made for Mordecai, whose, war whose warning saved the king. Uh, he stands at the house of Haman, and the king said, hang him on it. And so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath was pacified. First life lesson in this next series that we're dealing with is this. The presence of God is revealed as he brings strength to the weary, and justice to the wicked. Be grateful. Be grateful. As I was walking and thinking about uh, just reflecting on these verses this morning during my meditation time, the Lord, had, the Lord began to open up some interesting questions in my mind uh, about how he has positioned and prepared and, and purposed these things to take place and how it seems like the, God's audience is always... Uh, is always totally encompassing. It's like when he's, when, he's bringing, when he's laying out life lessons, he's got something in there for everybody, for everybody. He's got something in there for King Ahasuerus. He's got something in there for Haman. He's got something in there for Esther. He's got something in there for Mordecai. He's got something in there for all the Jewish people. 
And it's amazing how he works it out so that, it's, so that it speaks to them where they are. He has, <laughs> he has awakened the king and given him insight that there is something that needs to take place. And he's also, through Esther now, made it clear that Haman, this very Haman who came to him with the plan to extinguish the Jews, is not his, is not his confidant, is not his loyal follower. That Haman has his own plan, and God, and God is working through even the difficult moments to make it plain to King Ahasuerus that there's some wisdom that you need to have that can only come from God. And as he gets word from Esther, he asks Esther, Who is it that has the audacity to try to wipe out you and your people? Who is it that would would come up against the queen and, and and, uh, and her people at this very time? She has to point out to him that it's the very man that you have placed in charge of all your provinces. And the king, the, the teachable moment for the king is that you need to be, you need to be wise about who you trust. You need to follow up on, on the things that are, that are being placed underneath your hand. Just because you have power, you can't be just following any old kind of dictate, trusting any old kind of mindset. You need to check yourself, king, and check those that are coming to you and make sure that it is in line. Well, you know, you know you're not walking with the Lord, but make sure you got some wisdom about how you handle your business because it will come back on you. He's, 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 he's let, letting Haman know very clearly that if you think that you can rise up against God's anointed, if you, think that, if you think that you can lift your hands against God's people and somehow be blessed in the process, if you think that these temporal blessings will, will last for you, that it will somehow secure you, will keep you safe in the process, then you need to understand that, that the God has given you opportunities to turn from your wicked ways, and he keeps speaking wisdom into you, keeps surrounding you by those who are telling you the truth, and if you ignore the truth, there will be consequences. And to Esther, he's saying, If you stand in faith, if you trust in my preparation, my positioning, my purpose and plan, then my presence will be with you, daughter. And when you stand before the king, I will give you favor. And to Mordecai, he says, there's something powerful about prayer, son. When it looks like you're at your lowest ebb, God is not forsaking you. God hasn't turned his back on you. And he has this unique way of of taking what looks like uh, your your difficult moments in life, the times when when everything is turning against you and and turning it to your favor and turning it to God's glory. And all you need to do is trust God. He will turn your situation around. There's something powerful about the presence of God, how he gives us strength in the midst of our weary moments and and, and and handles the business of justice. It wasn't left up to Mordecai to handle the justice business. God will handle his own business. Business. Talk to me, somebody. And so he takes one moment, Haman is rejoicing and thinking that he's favored among the king. He can go in there and just manipulate king and, and have him sign any old petition because he's tired of looking at this Mordecai the Jew at the gate whom God has placed at the gate that he's got to walk past every moment. He's tired of looking at this guy day in and day out, and he wants to do something to... Didn't Haman have an opportunity? Help me out here. He's gotten the blessing of privilege and power. Why does he have to be concerned about Mordecai the Jew? At any moment in that process, past his perception, he has an opportunity to take his mind and his eye off of Mordecai the Jew and turn to what the God has in general blessed him with in the way of position and power. But there's something about a heart that's hardened to God. You just can't satisfy a heart that's hardened to God. Am I preaching to anybody but the camera? 
Somebody, you knew, you, you bumped up against somebody in your journey that you just, I don't care how much you talk about Jesus. I don't care how much you try to model Jesus in front of them. I don't care how much you try to love them into the kingdom. It ain't your power to love them into the kingdom anyway. You just need to plant that seed. You need to keep planting what God is doing. And their heart's going to do one or two things. They're going to be receptive to what God, the word of God and the presence and power of God. And they will open up and receive that blessing through Jesus Christ. Or they and their heart will harden their heart even more and try to push you away and push God away. Haman was pushing God away and thinking that he was still going to get the blessing. I'm trying to get through this first life lesson. And it's as if God wanted to make it plain that, uh, that, uh, that all things, Paul would say, that all things will work out to God's glory and to the good of the believer. Even when it can't, looks like it cannot possibly work out to your good. God will take your enemy and turn him into your blessing. And so the very, the very, uh, the very implement of Haman's hatred now becomes, uh, now becomes the vehicle of his demise. He built, he, man, he, he built those gallows. He built them strong. He built them so that you could see them. He wanted to make sure Mordecai saw the gallows. Y'all not with me, are you? He didn't just want to hang him on that. He, he wanted him to think about that a little bit. I want you to look at it and think, is that for me? You didn't bow down, walk by. You kept turning your head, walk by. You think you are proud, Mordecai, the Jew. And the very thing that he thought that he could stamp out God's, the leader, a a leader among God's people, now has become the very thing that he's going to be hanged on. And the king is in wrath that he has been fooled, in wrath that he has been, that that he's had the audacity to even approach the queen, in wrath that he was thinking that he could kill off his people. So God is, God is working out his purpose and his plan and absolutely instilling hope into his people. Now, let me flip on down to, the, to chapter 8, verses. I flip down to verses 7 through 9, because in here, uh, King Ahasuerus has taken, Haman's been hanged. He's given a house to Esther, who's then turned it over to Mordecai. And Esther, is, Esther comes back to him one more time in verses, in verses 5 and 6. And basically says, King, if I found favor in your sight, if, if I found favor humbly coming before you, if I found favor in your sight, uh, please write the letters, send the letters, reverse the letters that have been sent by Haman that, will, that indicates that the Jews will be destroyed, my people will be destroyed. He said, I cannot possibly endure the, uh, the sight that... Uh, the, the reality that my people will be endured, that Haman's edict will be carried out. And so we pick up at verse 7, and it says, And, the, and then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write also concerning the Jews, as it pleases you, Amplified says, in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For writing, for writing which is in the king's name and sealed by the king's ring, no man can reverse. Then verse 9 says, Then the king's scribes were called, and, and in the third month, the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, to the chief rulers, the governors, princes of the, of the provinces, from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to every province in its own script and to every people in their own language. Life lesson two. The purpose of God is revealed as he delivers.